Hello, loves. My name is Sarah Gomez, and you are listening to Romancing the Story. Now, if you haven't quite caught up to where I've been in the last year, uh, please feel free to reference the episode before this, the quick little update episode. I talked briefly about where I was and kind of things that had happened to me and why I'd kind of taken a break from the podcast. But TLDR, basically, you know, too long, didn't read. To sum it up, I I took a break because there had been a lot of things that had happened in the past year. You know, got a new job, um, had a family member, unfortunately, pass away, and then was dealing with some other kind of, um, like, legal issues. But I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm in a better place now, mentally, emotionally, and with that, I, I, I've, I've still been working behind the scenes with the podcast, you know, because this is still an outlet. I think this is really fun and I just want to talk to you guys and kind of learn more as I'm trying to write my own book, which let's be honest, I've written stuff before, fan fiction. Um, I have written like at least one book before and oh, it was so bad. Oh my God, it will never see the light of day. And I feel like most authors say that when they write their first book, like they're really, really, really honest to God first book. And they're like, no, this is awful. Who the hell wants to read this? Not me. So gonna pass hard, hard pass on that. No, thank you. (laughs) Yeah, my, that book will never see the light of day. I promise you that is, that is, that is shoved way way down like un like in the ground somewhere never to to be unearthed again i'm in the process of really putting in a great effort to write a series to write those books and i am so close to my first draft guys i'm not even like just i could taste it oh so close so i'm gonna that is my big goal for right now and in the meantime i've been talking to authors to kind of learn a bit about their process, talk with them about their journey because everyone's journey is different, right? Everyone's journey is different as far as writing a book and what you find important in the process and what you really hone in on. Some people are better, like some people really are great at atmosphere, building an atmosphere. Some people are great at character development. Some people are really great at like creating plots, And I just kind of want to learn about these different strengths and how I can best utilize them in my own writing. If you guys happen to learn something along the way, awesome. So with that being said, I'm going to kind of jump into this episode. I think this is episode 13. (laughs) I literally had to step away and check, guys. I mean, that's how like, like how long it's been and, and like, like, kind of the craziness that there's like all the things that are going through my brain right now and you guys are just kind of getting the brunt end of it because I'm just kind of basically just you're getting my babble of my conscious thinking just like like no filter just kind of like throwing it out and seeing what happens (laughs) verbally so I mean good luck trying to decipher it (laughs) no I'm kidding I'm kidding but yes I think this is lucky number 13 that was that's a good episode right that's a great episode to kind of start off on Um, I know some people think it's an unlucky number, but, you know, people like me and Taylor Swift are kind of on the same, the same wavelength on this one. Lucky number 13. And what a better episode to start off with than my, you know, uh, mi amor, mi amiga, (laughs) Kimberly Packard, who also, I think, loves her some Taylor Swift as well. I know we've both been listening to the album she's been putting out on repeat quite a bit. In this interview, I get a chance to speak with Kimberly Packard, and you may recognize her, or recognize her voice at least, from a previous episode where I got the chance to talk about women's fiction and and how she writes within that kind of demographic and that genre. She has had a brand new release called Dyer's Club. And when I tell you this might just be her magnum opus, I am not exaggerating in the slightest. She put her heart and soul into this. Absolutely 
just, and you can feel it. And that's the kind of writing I love. And we, we, we talk really about writing the story of your heart. And I think that's where it's so important to talk about specifically this story is because it, it was something that was pressed upon her that she felt like she had to write. And it really, I mean, it really was a profound and hard, but really like necessary theme to tie, kind of talk about. And spoiler alert, it's about death, but like the hope, finding the hope in death and really kind of living, finding that will to live and, and really trying to live in your best life. And what a, what a great thing to talk about like right now. And again, there is mention of death. So like trigger warning for people there. So sorry. We'll try to put this at the top of the episode. So instead of hearing me babble about it, let's go ahead and jump into the episode and talk to Kim. I have a bit, I mean, you probably can't see it. And actually I think the swelling's gone down, but um, Tully and I had a little accident last night. Like his back elbow thing on his back leg collided with my forehead. <gasps> Ouch. Yeah. Oh and my he, gosh. Yeah. So I had like a goose egg last night. It's actually still kind of sore. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Yeah, I wouldn't have no, really noticed and thought anything of it, but <laughs> yeah, it's it, like either a, a zit or injury from my dog. It can go either way. So. <laughs> fair, fair, same here. Yeah. Same yeah. With, yeah, same with mine. And no matter how small or big they are, they always want to take up all the bed. Like yeah. always want to be in your space, all your space. Yeah. <laughs> he was super wound up last night. Like he, mm. so he is a classic toddler. I really think that this is, he, it, it's like he ended up in the wrong body. It's like, have you seen Soul yet? on haven't not yet okay. it's really awesome but there's a part where someone accidentally ends up in a cat's body for this little bit it's really kind of funny but mm -hmm. uh, I'm like, oh my god I think you were meant to be a child and you ended up in a dog's body because you know how kids get really overstimulated and they're just like ah, nah. and you're just like dude you should be really tired they're like I'm not tired I'm not tired <laughs> that is him so he went to daycare yesterday and they were like oh he played his butt off and you would think that he would be exhausted and no, yeah. the opposite. Oh man. And we were just trying to like eat dinner and watch TV. And finally, we just had to put him in his crate because he was just being such a little monster. And it's like, dude, you just need to settle down. Welcome to the show, uh, a returning guest <laughs> and Kimberly Packard. Yay. You, Sarah. I feel like I'm the returning champ. You've been an award-winning women's fiction author, and we haven't talked in a while. And since then, you've had another book release in yeah. women's fiction. Yeah, a um, recently released novel called Dyer's Club. And it's, um, you know, one way I kind of describe it is it's the breakfast club meets the bucket list. Um, so it's about a group of strangers who are on their last hurrah, but they're the, the one thing they have in common is that they all have terminal il illnesses. Mm -hmm. So they're all dying. Hence the name Dyer's club. Ah, so now I know we, like I've read portions of this book and I know that we've talked a lot about it in the last what, couple of years, maybe even, mm -hmm. but how was this because I know this book is very special to you mm -hmm. and how is this one different from the others would you say you know this one's different in several different ways first of all it came to me in a dream um I a lot of my other books they'll hit me but they hit me kind of in the daytime um this was a nocturnal thing because it literally woke me up from a sleep <laughs> and that good was, huh <laughs> yeah. But what awoke me up was I was talking to Jimmy Dyer, one of the main characters, and it was in this conversation we were having, he just looks at me and he says, everybody dies. The lucky ones have fun doing it. And it woke me up and I'm like, what the heck was that? And um, I grabbed a journal and I just started writing. And um, I actually, because I, you know, I keep all my journals because authors are also pack rats. And um, <laughs> Pretty much. comes with the territory. So I actually looked up that journal. I was like, when was that? And it was back in 2014. And wow. I remember I had a writing event. I was doing this um, program at a local grocery store chain where um, they would invite local authors to come in and sell books in the frozen food aisle or wherever they stick us. 
And I remember <laughs> that day, like, I don't think I ever looked up. I think I just sat there and just journaled, like, there's going to be this and this and this and these kind of characters. And, you know, it was like a performance art day in the frozen food aisle with the author who was like, yeah, yeah, buy a book if you want, but I'm, don't, leave, don't bother me. <laughs> um, so, um, but I, so, so yeah, that right there, I think was really unusual for me. But then once I kind of got into it and started peeling back, like, what is this story? Um, it's the largest cast of characters that I've written in POV form. So um, like Phoenix and Vortex and, and um, those books, um, they, you know, three, I think Prospera passed the last Phoenix book, I actually have four POVs. But um, this one is all of the Dyers. So mm -hmm. um, Charlotte, Levi, Celeste, Dylan, and Lourdes, plus Jimmy, and plus his assistant, Darla. So seven points of view, um, which wow. in a lot of places, they'll tell you, don't do that. That's way too many. Um, and I really started writing, writing the book, which is Charlotte and Jimmy and Darla, because I love Darla. Uh, but then Leanne Moriarty came out with Nine Perfect Strangers and she has all these POVs and I'm like, oh, cool. I can do it. She already broke mm -hmm. the rule. So it's, it's cool. I can do this. Um, so, it, and I think that's when it, the book really kind of bloomed and blossomed was when I went back in and added those new voices. Well, and I'm so glad you did because I remember reading from the different points of view mm -hmm. that you kind of uh, brought to our group that we kind of, you know, work together in and then we're kind of, and, and I'd read some of those pieces and I felt like it was such a richer story yeah. for having all those points of view mm -hmm. because, and I always love, I have a soft spot in my heart for uh, books or TV shows or anything that has a big cast of characters because no matter mm -hmm. what, you're going to find someone who you relate to or you connect with, you're gonna find a different character on the page somewhere that you, you are going to connect with in one form or another. Yeah, and that's what was so fun is, and these characters are really, you know, in, in some ways they are larger than life. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got Lourdes, she's a telenovela star. Oh, yeah. um, you've got Levi, he's this, you know, British rocker. He's kind of a cross between like Keith Richards and Billy Idol in, in my mind, um, you know, so, they and then you've got Charlotte, who even though she's a quieter character, you know she's got this powerful force um, within her, and she's a life coach. So um, and then you got Darla, and Darla is you know she's an assistant, but um, she is feisty. She's someone that in Darla's world everything is kind of stacking up against her. You mm -hmm. know, it's like the poor girl just can't catch a break, but yet it. it she is one of the most positive, cheerful, gosh darn it, I'm gonna make it work anyways, people and determined. And I, you just, I just loved her spirit. Mm -hmm. So um, it was fun. It was fun for me to kind of slip into all their different heads and, and write from their points of view. Yeah, and, and I really enjoyed the portions of, because the plot moved along very nicely and you did a great job of kind of keeping the momentum with that, mm -hmm. which is so easy to get bogged down with so many characters. And I love that you kind of kept the momentum by kind of like, almost like this globe trotting across, mm -hmm. you know, uh, across all these uh, continents and all these places. But also too, we got to see a lot of, it was almost a character study in some regard. Yeah. Like with each of the characters, I, I did love, like I said, so when you were writing all that, because you are right, these characters are larger than life. Mm -hmm. They have way different experiences from each other, totally different personalities. How challenging was it as a writer to try to keep track of all that and like be in everyone's head? Uh, you know, it wasn't that difficult because they all just were so distinct to me. Okay. Um, so like Levi, you know, um, when I first wrote Levi's chapter, he was the first one that I kind of dug into when I said, I'm going to add all these voices in. Mm -hmm. um, and what was really cool about him was I could almost hear him in the back of my head go, it's about bloody time, you know? <laughs> um, that sounds like Levi too. <laughs> it <sounds> like Levi. <laughs> and so I think he was just so ready. And, you know, um, Lourdes was a little difficult because she as a character was very guarded in the beginning. And then, you know, she's a star. She's, she's used to people wanting her for what's on the outside. And because of what she's battling, a lot of that's gone. 
So it almost was like I had to really, and, and I, Charlotte was this, well, Charlotte had to work to get to know Lourdes. And I think I had to work to get to know Lourdes because as a character, she wasn't like Levi, where it's like, here I am, get to know me. Mm -hmm. She was kind of like, hmm, you gotta earn my trust. And so, yeah. um, so that was really kind of interesting um, when I would write her chapters. And, you know, Celeste was just, you know, Celeste was like everybody's mom, you know, the mom that's like, you know, I'm going to wear, you know, the oldest jeans I've got because I'm going to buy my kids stuff and I'm going to, you know, put aside everything I wanted to do for my kids. And, you know, now it's her turn and she almost doesn't know how to be selfish and, and to take her turn. And, um, and then you've got Dylan and, you know, he's this poor kid who's dealing with something. And so really, you know, when it was time for me to write all their different pieces, they were just so distinct. It was like, I just, I knew where we were going with that from the beginning. And, and you bring up with like talking about the characters, I'm thinking about it too. I do appreciate that you kind of wrote different age brackets too, yeah. because we all have different experiences at different ages. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and, you know, and unfortunately, you know, the dying isn't just, you know, uh, for the old at yeah. this point. So like I did, I love that the fact that you had different types of ages throughout the book as well. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was really interesting too because in Dylan you know it was hard to because in in some ways he's the youngest character he's 23 but he's very much an old soul mm -hmm. and um you know he was someone that grew up before his time so in in many ways I think that's why he gelled so well with the group was he wasn't really a kid mm -hmm. um because he he had to grow up early and young and and you know kind of aged up and you know there's a scene where they're all shouting profanities off the side of a mountain and he kind of was like oh my god these people <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, I think, you know, he just, he's really comfortable with this group of, you know, older people, you know, both Charlotte and Lourdes are, you know, into their early forties. And then you've got, you know, Jimmy is in his late forties, early fifties. And um, then we've got um, Celeste and Levi are, you know, 60 plus. And so, you know, in some ways, Dylan was much more comfortable around them um, right. because he, you know, he was used to being a, the kid in the room of all adults his entire life. Which makes total sense and yeah. to his character as well. So you had the idea in 2014. Mm -hmm. I have a thought process here. <laughs> so <laughs> in 2014, because I know that between then, from the moment you had that idea mm -hmm. to, to when you've released it, you've released other books mm -hmm. in that time span. Yeah. So it, it, I'm kind of curious, why, why did it take you so long? Did you feel like? I think, well, um, I knew it was going to be a challenging book to write. So I think I almost had to grow up a little bit. Like I had to grow into that story, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, you know, I think at that point I had the first Phoenix book was out. I think I had written Part and Falls, like, I don't know, a million times. It seems like I, that second book was a tough one for me. But I was trying to finish up the Phoenix series and then Vortex came along. So, um, but the whole time, you know, Dyer's Club was in the back of my head. And, and I was kind of always thinking about the characters, developing the story, kind of working on it. But it took me, I, I did not sit down to start writing it until um, I think it was 2018, maybe, mm -hmm. that I, you know, sat and put words to paper. So it's, you know, four years between when I sat down to, you know, I journaled it out at the supermarket to, you know, writing, you know, chapter one. Um, but I really think I, I knew it was going to be a big story to take. And I kind of felt like I needed to mature into it. Right. And I was actually wondering if that was the case, because I feel like there, there are times as a, we, as writers, we mm -hmm. get these great ideas or these books uh, or or like uh, we have these maybe series ideas or something like that where we sit down and we have we struggle to write it and mm -hmm. I think sometimes our skill isn't necessarily up to the task of really telling the story like it needs to be told exactly exactly and you know the other thing that I you know kind of and loosely modeled it after is the Canterbury Tales yes uh, Oh yeah. I love the I Canterbury. Love the, yes. I'm with you, girl. I love the Canterbury Tales. Yeah, like I loved it so much that in college I had, I needed an extra credit and there was like the semester class that was just on Chaucer. 
And I signed up for it. I remember my dad, you know, kind of looking at my course schedule and he's like, what's this class? And I'm like, oh, the Canterbury Tales. Da, da, da. He's like, so yeah, how's that going to help you in life? And it's like, well, now I have this book. <laughs> um, but that, and it's not exactly structured like that. Cause you know, that is, you know, the pilgrims are telling their stories on mm -hmm. the journey, but it inspired my thinking of the chapters of the POV characters flank their adventures. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of see it through their eyes. And, and I just kind of love that structure of people telling stories, you know, or, or you get to see into their lives at this certain time. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, but I, I also needed the confidence to write it too. You know, as authors, we have, you know, I, I would even say that a lot of, you know, fairly famous authors probably still have these little moments of self-doubt. I think it's always going to be there. I was actually um, emailing with a friend of mine who's also in the literary world. And I was like, you know, the imposter syndrome, self-doubt, I think it's always going to be there. It's just something we've got to learn to manage and, and live around. So I don't think I could have written this as my second book, or maybe I would have, but it would never have seen the light of day. I completely agree. I think that imposter syndrome is real. Mm -hmm. And like, we do have to kind of believe in ourselves because nothing really think about it. If you think about it, there's thing is stopping us from sitting down and writing an entire book, yeah. like in 30 days, like NaNoWriMo or like within a couple of months, mm -hmm. you know, now the quality of that book is questionable, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but, but those things, I think too, you have to learn how to find your voice mm -hmm. within that time. You have to learn how, what, like how story, how you can story tell differently. Cause like you said, like we've talked about in the previous podcast, every book has its own process, has its own voice. So it's, it's really important to be able to find that in kind of the midst of writing. Yeah. And every book has a rhythm and, you know, with Dyer's Club, you know, and, and it was, you know, kind of picking out the rhythm and, and, you know, when is it Charlotte's turn to have a say, because she really is the main character. I mean, she's the girl on the cover and really, mm -hmm. you know, this book is ultimately about her um, and how, you know, her life has changed mm -hmm. by this. Um, but it was, you know, picking up the rhythm of, you know, who's, who's POV are we going to listen to here and who's, who can best tell this story? I completely agree with you. I think that if, if it hadn't been in all those points of view, I don't think the story would have been nearly as impactful mm -hmm. as it really, as it has, has been. Yeah. And then, and you're right. Like as writers too, like when we write our early stuff, we usually shove it aside and like, Ooh, we're not going to touch that for a while. <laughs> we're not gonna talk about that one. <laughs> I know. Yeah. We don't, we don't yeah. talk about that one anymore, guys. Sorry. It's, you know, we should always have that story in the back, you know, that story that I don't even say in the back of our minds, the story in our heart that we said this story, one of these days, I'm going to be ready to write it. And that's kind of something we've chatted about too, is like the story. Cause I know that there is a story that I've started and I put aside saying, I don't have the skill set for that yet. Yeah. I know what I want to do with it, but I don't have the tools in my tool belt yet. Mm -hmm. As Stephen King would say, like, I just do not have the tools in my toolbox to, to properly put that story together to make it yeah. something special. I know that Dyer's Club really uh, has benefited from the fact that you were able to put together all these points of view in such a succinct manner. Mm -hmm. And we're able to kind of um, write that out. And I know, like you said, it's a story in your heart. It just kept like sitting on you and it's something you wanted to write, right? Yeah, yeah. Like um, this, you know, so there's this um, theory and I've kind of had this theory and then um, there's this great book called Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. And it's a series of essays that she's written about creativity. And um, there, she has a, a, an essay in this book about how um, she thinks stories are kind of just out there in the ether. And they're, they're, they're looking for their parent and they're like that one. And they zoom in, they go, okay, you be my, you be my story mama. And <laughs> you know, then you become story pregnant. And so, but she, she has this um, story about how she had an idea for a book and, and it was going to be a love story about the scientist who was in the Brazilian rainforest mm -hmm. and then life got in the way. She never had a chance to write it. And she's good friends with Ann Patchett. And she tells this interesting story about how she and Ann traded letters. And so 
she had written, they were trading letters back and forth about things they were writing and, you know, Liz was having a tough time with the story. And finally they catch back up and Anne is saying, oh my gosh, I got this great story that I've been working on. And basically without knowing that that's what Liz was working on, that the story had hopped to her. And Liz was kind of like, oh my gosh, because she had been trying to write it. It was just gone. The story had left her. And so she was like, oh my gosh, this is so weird. So when did the story hit you? And she was like, honestly, not long after I'd seen you last. And so they kind of laughed about the story, just literally went, okay, you're not ready for me and hopped. So I do kind of think that if we don't receive the stories when they're given to us, I'm going to sound so woo-woo right now, but if they... <laughs> Don't, if we're not ready for them that, and they're ready to be born, they'll find someone else. And, um, and this essay is so wonderful because it shows the grace that Liz had said, um, to Anne, you know, take care of our baby. You know? <laughs> um, so I do think that, you know, as authors, you know, if a story isn't ready for us or we're not ready for it and it jumps to someone else, you know, that's okay. Yeah. It might be kind of sad, but another one will come along. And so I think that, you know, when Dyer's Club hit me, when Jimmy came to me in my dreams, I was just like, I am not letting the sucker go. And so I think the fact that I was always kind of thinking about it, always, you know, the characters they were forming in my mind and coming to me and, and, you know, um, it gave me the opportunity to hang on to it and keep it in my heart. And, and it is, I think the book of my heart so far. Um, another one may come along in a few years, but you know, this one, you know, it, it looks at themes like loneliness and loss and grief and forgiveness and, you know, leaving our mark in the world. Um, you know, these are all just really big themes to, to deal with and grapple with. And I think it's something that, you know, I started writing this book, you know, years ago and had no clue we would have a pandemic. Um, but I think it's something that we think about even more now when we realize life is really precious. And we should hang on to all the time we have and all the ones that we have in our lives. Right. And I, I mean, and that's something that the book really brought up was like points of like grief mm -hmm. and like dealing with those existential crises. Like, what do mm -hmm. I do with the rest of my life? You know, now, especially now when I'm at a crossroads of like, you have a basically not sugarcoating at a death sentence, basically, you know? Yeah. And so like, how, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a very interesting point of view that you decided to kind of explore in the, in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, each person deals with it differently. You know, mm -hmm. Levi was just going to have one last good party and, you know, his <laughs> adventure was to play one, one last concert and just, you know, the groupies, the everything he wanted at all. Um, and, you know, it's like, Hey, yeah, if there's that moment in your life that you're just like, I want to go back to that moment. Um, you know, Celeste, it was the thing she's wanted to do her entire life, but, um, she almost didn't do it because ever the caregiver and the nurturer, she was worried about other people. Um, you know, Dylan hit, so his adventure kind of changed in the story. Um, but he was, you know, his was kind of an extension of his work. You know, he wanted to, you know, try to do this really big, cool experiment at this world renowned lab. And, and, you know, in some ways the changing of the adventure for him was no, 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 you get to go be a kid and let's just go play. You don't have to keep being an adult. And for Lourdes, you know, she just, she picked something that was completely against what people would see on the outside. And, and actually I think um, it was something Celeste had said was, oh, I expected you would have wanted a weekend shopping in Paris. And instead she wanted, you know, a night camping in the African safari. And um, it, it was very different than what you would have expected of someone as glamorous as her. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, she was just like, I just need to be able to breathe. I need to be away from all the people. Yeah. And dealing with such heavy subject matter, mm -hmm. I mean, was, was that like draining emotionally as well? Oh yeah. Yeah. Actually the week, so the week I started writing it and I hope I have my year, right? I think it was 2018. Um, but the exact week that I started putting words on paper was the week that Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade took their lives. Oh, if you remember, they happened within a couple of days of each other. You're right. Now that I think about it, Yes. Yeah. I do remember that. And I just remember, you know, especially early on with Charlotte, because 
you know, some of her earlier chapters were the ones where she was feeling some of the most despair. I would write her chapter and then I'd just have to go walk. I'd have to just get out of my head mm. um, because she does, she's, you know, it, it's a mental health story, but it's also a grief story. And it's something that in some ways, the grief that she had for her lost fiance um, took on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think really, you know, she, she didn't want to let go of the grief because in some ways, when she stopped grieving him, he was no longer part of her life. And so I think that was why she just, you know, could not stop because she just wanted to hang on to him as long as she could. Mm -hmm. So writing that and she, you know, where she lives is, you know, this, it's um, one of the barrier islands off the coast of South Carolina. And she lives at the far end all by herself. And she really has kind of created this loneliness around her. Um, and that was tough, you know, it was, it was really tough to be in that perspective. Um, oh, I'm sure like trying to like, and it sounds like, and I know that she also not only just like mentally and emotionally, but physically kind of barricaded yeah. herself away from other people. Yeah. So yeah. like, I, I I'm sure being in that, and it was her perspective always seemed a little heavier mm -hmm. than the other ones. Yeah. So yeah. like, I do appreciate, cause I'll let uh, reader or uh, listeners know that don't worry guys whenever you read the book there are moments of levity <laughs> there are yes there are some... you can't yeah you can't have like either humor in there you can't there have like all all the drag all the time so don't yeah, worry yeah. <laughs> that's where I think Levi you know was the the levity he was just hilarious and you just mm -hmm. can't help but love him and Darla you know yeah. sassy as can be and um but even you know there were moments where Charlotte laughed and moments, I mean, they all had their, their moments where they could have fun and laugh and, you know, just appreciate life. And, and, you know, also it does end on a happy note. This is, mm -hmm. you know, it's ultimately a story about hope. Right. And that's, that, I think that's the key thing because mm -hmm. even in, in a story kind of where the main, all, you know, it's like, most of your cast is dying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like they're given a terminal, you know, a terminal, <laughs> Ill, they have a terminal illness there. It's still ultimately a story about hope really mm -hmm. when it boils down to it. And that's who we are as humans. Yeah. You know? We're very hopeful creatures. We really are. And I think that, you know, no matter how hard something gets and, and even, you know, with Charlotte and her grief, you know, no matter how dark it may get, you can still find that light. There is still a light there. Mm -hmm. um, you just have to be willing to ask for help and you've got to be willing to, you know, put, make yourself vulnerable and put yourself out there Absolutely. and let yourself love again. Cause I think that was it too, is ultimately she was afraid of falling in love again. Uh, absolutely. And that's a big part of it too. That's a big part of the grieving process. Oh yeah. You know, that people like underestimate. Sometimes you are afraid to move on from that yeah yeah and i i don't want to give it too much away but you know she yeah. finds love in a very different way okay. um but ultimately it's you know that ending it was you know it's funny i even editing it i would cry every time i'd read it and it's a happy cry you know don't worry it's all good <laughs> but, uh, because i was just like this is where she needed to be and i felt so um satisfied with her story like yes, girl, we got you there, you know? <laughs> um, thank you for hanging in there with me. I knew we yep. could do this. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We did it together. But like, did you already did? So did you have the ending in mind when you really, when you were like, like you said, just kind of scribbling out the notes and stuff like that? You know, um, some of my stories and you know, I've talked about this. I know the beginning and know the ending. Like when mm -hmm. I said, I'm like, I know Phoenix, I knew how it was going to start and how it's going to end. Mm -hmm. Um, Dyer's Club, I didn't really know the ending until it, I knew it when I started writing it, but, um, the process I did for that is I, you know, did a, a plotting of it and it, I'm, I'm plotting it. And I'm like, I don't know where we're going with this. We'll see. We'll mm -hmm. see. And then as I kind of got to the end of my plot board, I was like, oh, that's what's going to happen. Okay. This is perfect. And gotcha. so, yeah. So really kind of once I plotted it out, I knew, and, and I think that's what made it easier for, um, 
you know, that writing is, especially in those hard times of Charlotte's, I knew ultimately she was going to be okay. It always feels good when you can give your characters at least to have somewhat of a happy ending, right? Yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I, I don't think I could write a story where it's like, well, sucks to be you, you know, I mean, it's just, I, I think just that's just who I am. And then, you know, there's got to be some hope and there's got to be some happiness and it may Absolutely. not be the ending that they wanted, but it's the ending they needed. And there you go. I mean, I, I think that's important to think mm -hmm. about. Sometimes it's, and I mean, that's just life in general, yeah. but like that's, it's really important. Sometimes you may not have wanted that for the character, but maybe that is exactly what they needed in order to make sure their journey was worthwhile or mm -hmm. that they've grown as a person. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I do have a question though about the point of views for the characters. Did you ever decide like going into it how many points of view you might have had, like you might have, like as far as like how many chapters Levi would have or how many chapters Charlotte would have or anything like that. For the, um, what we're going to call the supporting cast, um, mm -hmm. I knew for Levi, Lourdes and Dylan and Celeste, I would do two chapters each because I kind of <laughs> was thinking it would book in their, you know, around their adventures. Um, for Darla, Oh gosh, how many does she have? Like five or six. Mm. And you know, hers were just kind of, I need Darla's POV. You know, I needed to show that um, because she uh, spoiler alert, she kind of lightly turns on Jimmy, but she's not the villain. I mean, not at all, because I I didn't want the reader to get mad at Darla for doing what she did because she had to and really jimmy never got mad at her for doing what she did because he realized she had to um so and you know with jimmy it was you know he, i would call him kind of the the you know the secondary pov character um and you know same i think we just needed to see you know why in the world would somebody create a business that catered to dying people and you know, and, and, you know, and in the story, the, the death that he's facing is the death of his business. And part of it is he never really wanted to charge as much as he should have. And, um, you know, he, he could have made a killing off this, but he realized, no, this is kind of a service people need it. So, you know, I didn't really have a formula for us outside of the other dyers. I didn't really have a formula for must have this many. I just kind of said, yeah, when it's their turn, they'll tell me. Ah, see, and that's perfect. I, I like when that kind of, it comes more organically than yeah. like that too. That's very interesting to me, but mm -hmm. also, so for Dyer's Club specifically, we, we talked about like kind of the content of it, right? Like yeah. it has several cast, it has a large cast in it. It's kind of about, it's ultimately about hope, but dealing yeah. with grief as well and mm -hmm. kind of the globe trotting of it all like kind of all these adventures that they kind of go go for go yeah. on and kind of the structure is very reminiscent of the mm -hmm. Cadbury tales yeah Canterbury tales so what did you have to do or did you think about maybe doing any kind of research for it especially since I mean like Dyer's Club is such a the idea of Dyer's Club to me seems like such a out there idea i've never heard of anyone doing that but no. it, it sounds like it could exist in the it really world. could be a thing i you know i, I kind of jokingly in the early days i was like it's like make a wish for adults you know um without the nonprofit aspect of it you know um but um you know i did a little google searching like let me make sure this isn't a thing and nothing came up um you know i think you know i i do think there's people that take bucket trip, bucket list trips, and, you know, definitely do stuff like that. Um, so really, you know, some of the research that I did, um, I, it was things that kind of find me almost organically. Like, for example, um, about a year ago, I, I don't remember how I found this podcast, but I stumbled upon a podcast called Dying for Sex. And it was this really interesting, it's very sad, but the First season is about a woman who's um, podcasting with her best friend who's dying of breast cancer. And, but this woman that's dying, um, you know, she, in the midst of dealing, and she's had multiple bouts of cancer, but in the midst of all that, she had gotten a divorce 
after getting married very young, she never really had her sexual awakening until she was dying. And so it was really interesting. They, you know, the, the ladies would talk and, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And I think her podcast really helped me kind of wrap my head around Lourdes. Um, because you have someone that, you know, everything that in her mind made her a woman is gone. And, you know, but yet, you know, she is still very much a feminine, you know, sexual being, but how do you kind of reconcile that? And so, um, so there were little things like that that would kind of find me and, you know, um, and then of course, just a ton of Googling on to the different places. And I'm pretty sure that I broke the space time continuum on getting them from point A to point B and there's no jet lag. And I know that, but um, that's where I just need, you know, readers to suspend disbelief for a little bit with me, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, just kind of some research on different places and some stuff that would just kind of find me. Um, you know, I did a little research on, um, I found a memoir that someone had written as they were dying and it was, you know, so this, uh, you know, those little things that you kind of read to, um, kind of understand what it must feel like. But I also found that once I started, um, I don't know, it, it didn't seem that hard because in some ways, I mean, we start dying the minute we're born, you know, there's that, um, philosophy. Um, but in some ways, you know, every day could be our last day. You never know what tomorrow could bring. And so, um, I think it just, you know, kind of thinking about that helped. So. And that's like, that's really fascinating because sometimes we, we write outside of our comfort zone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I know since this was the kind of a story of your heart, at least for now, it, it was important, you know, mm -hmm. it's always important to have not only the tools, but maybe the research to kind of back some of that up. And I think that's really, I didn't even think about that, but that makes total sense for Lourdes to mm -hmm. that. She, you know, she did lose a lot of, yeah. and, and her confidence too. And the, you know, the things that we perceive to make a woman and yet mm -hmm. she, she is still a sexual being. She is still feminine. She is still a woman, mm -hmm. but you know, those, and those things are hard to kind of think about, but are very real yeah. to you, especially the characters and the life that they're living. Like mm -hmm. you said, it, it is the author. And it's always interesting to me because I like the often authentic touches, like things like that, that make it special to me. Cause I feel like, oh, like this writer has given a lot of thought, mm -hmm. a lot of effort, a lot of love to these characters to really think about them in a very three-dimensional way. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and they are all characters that, you know, I love and, you know, I, I feel like I almost want to write a book for Darla and just give her everything <laughs> that she didn't get in this world because I just adored her, mm -hmm. um, but really with all of them and, you know, um, and, you know, and, and I know that in some ways they're butterflies, you know, their lives are very short, you know, I, I, in, in the writing world, I'm coming up at the end of their lives. Um, but I'm, I feel just so fortunate to have had the time I have with them, you know? Mm -hmm. And in and, and retrospect, how, how was it different? How is it, has it been different from like your other books? Like after you've written them, like it, are they, is there any difference from Dyer's Club? Like the, the kind of the euphoria of having written the book as opposed to maybe some of the others, or is it kind of just similar? Uh, I actually was a lot more terrified to release it and I'm still terrified. I'm, you know, a day and a half into the book is in the world and um, fortunately I've had a handful of reviews pop up and they're all very lovely reviews, but, um, this was one that I, um, again, there was several times that I was like, I'm going to cancel it. Nope, nope, nope. We're not going to release it. Nope, uh -uh. Nope. <laughs> um, because I just, you know, I, I think I, I'm a little more protective of it, I guess, because it is the book of my heart. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I'm very protective of the characters. Mm -hmm. um, well, they're like your kids, right? They're, they're like, yeah, yeah, they're like, so your, I'm, I'm yeah. like the helicopter author. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most perfect thing I've ever heard. And that, that makes total sense. The helicopter <laughs> author, you got to protect your, you got to protect the, the youngins there. You got to protect the, the book, the book characters. But at the same time, I mean, I didn't protect them in the stories. I mean, you know, <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I, I, I did make them, you know, have to 
you know, even in, you know, moments that were supposed to be lovely, you know, there's, there's actually a love scene with Lourdes and she has to shed all this, you know, stuff that she had been wearing to make it look like she's totally fine and be completely vulnerable. And that was, even though that was meant to be a love scene and something that would have been good, it was really hard for her. So, mm. you know, though there, I didn't really protect them, but now I'm trying to protect them from the big bad world. So. I know, right? And a lot of times too, I know, because we had talked about this, like the book itself is kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to pitch in a way, unless you kind of like understand it, kind of going, kind of understanding what it's about or knowing what it's about, that it's these different points of views. Yes. These people are dying. Um, they're reconciling with that. And that's why they're going on these adventures is to try to, and then ultimately the book is about hope, but yeah, I understand like especially like, but some of the best books are sometimes the hardest, the hardest yeah. like sales or the hardest to understand. And so, like just at, from a high level, right. Mm -hmm. Big cast of characters, different points of view. Like you said, the nine perfect strangers, which mm -hmm. did amazingly well. Yeah. Yeah. I owe Leanne a lot for writing that book. Cause it gave me the per, you know, permission that I kind of wanted always to do it, but I didn't know I could do it. And then I was like, I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to have all these voices. Um, and you know, it is, it is a hard book to kind of explain to people. It's like, yeah, so everybody's dying and, but I promise it's good. It's not all bad, you know? Um, but yeah, that, that log line is kind of a tough one. And so sometimes it's just easiest to say the bucket list meets the breakfast club, you know, um, the people that you don't expect to be, you know, friends are really good friends. And, you know, and, and in my mind, um, Celeste and Dylan, you know, kind of go off and take care of each other in a very, you know, um, family sort of way, not anything weird, but, um, yeah. you know, um, Jimmy and Lourdes um, have each other at the end and, you know, and Charlotte has her, yeah. her happy ending. Um, but, you know, so it is a book about, you know, finding those connections that stick with you even after the time is over. Exactly. And I love what you said about to finding, finding permission mm -hmm. in like other authors work. I think that's why it's really important as, as authors to not only read, but try to seek out other authors or other content that we kind of want to write about or write in, you know, those, yeah. those type of things, because seeing someone else break that mold or seeing someone else kind of write in a similar way, it mm -hmm. kind of gives you, like we talked about the confidence, the courage even yeah. to say like, okay, I can do this then. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not like you're plagiarizing or copying or anything like yeah. that. That's exactly what it is. It's the courage to say, oh, that can be done. Mm -hmm. I can do it. And, you know, maybe I can do it as well as, you know, Leanne did. I mean, she, that book is fantastic. I think I read it in like two days. And, um, you know, so it, it really is about, you know, I, I always think of the author community as we build on each other and build up each other, you know, uh, we are just a bunch of, you know, little bricks that kind of just like, you know, help pull mm -hmm. each other up, hold each other up. Um, you know, you say, oh my gosh, so-and-so did this, I can do this too. And then someone else is going to come along and, and we all just, you know, build this beautiful library of books. I'm going to try to wrap up that metaphor, but, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's why we need to, you know, be part of a, an um, ecosystem of, of literature and authors and, and books, because it, it can give us so many tools and, you know, you to, going back to the story that you want to write, you know, there's going to be something that you cross paths with that you're just going to be like, oh, I see now I can do this. Like, it's just as the, mm -hmm. you know, the universe just put it in, in your way and you stumbled into it. So exactly, exactly. And sometimes too, like, like you said, it, it's, it's the, the fact of finding those things or those things finding you really, mm -hmm. and then kind of keeping that story. Like, I don't want the story to leave me. So like you did, I kind of wrote it all down. So oh, it, I want to yeah. hold it close to my heart, but yeah, I, but I know I, there are certain tools, certain like writing craft, like I have to learn to do better before I can really say what I want to say with the book. If listeners want to read this mm -hmm. amazing book, we've been talking so much about the, the Dyer's, Dyer's Club, 
Mm -hmm. Where can they find it? Um, Dyer's Club is available wherever you buy books. So it's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, Apple Books. I went wide with it. So um, anywhere you buy books, you can find it there. Okay, where can listeners also connect with you? So you can definitely go to my website and sign up for my newsletter. I usually forget it exists, um, but you'll kind of randomly get emails from me, but um, mostly pictures of my dog, what I'm reading, what I'm listening to, um, what I'm writing. Um, I guess that's why they signed up. Um, so that's one way. Um, you can also find me on the socials. I'm on um, Facebook. It's Kimberly Packard author. Um, Instagram and Twitter at Kimberly Packard, and that's P-A-C-K-A-R-D. Um, on Instagram, you'll find just a ton of pictures of my dog and cat, because really, you know, it's all about them. Muchas gracias to Kimberly Packard for being on today's episode and talking about her great book, Dyer's Club. Now, the book recommendation, obviously, for this episode is Dyer's Club. And if you're looking for a great summer read and really just want your heartstrings pulled on, highly recommend. And that will be the conclusion of today's episode. Be sure to follow me on at Romance the Story on Instagram or Twitter if you want to kind of see other little bite-sized pieces of what I'm putting out, what I'm working on. And as always... Hope you guys are staying safe, staying healthy, and taking care of yourself. Much love. Bye.